Hey, this is Ben Wilmore from Digital Mastery, and I'm gonna show you in this video how I took a boring looking picture straight out of camera and transformed it into something that I think is really interesting looking. And I'm gonna do the entire process using only Lightroom Classic, and that means you could make the same transformation using just Adobe Camera Raw because it shares the same adjustments. And in the process, you're gonna learn a metric shit ton of tips about using Lightroom. So let's get started. Before we dive in and actually process the image, let's just take a look at the camera settings that were used. This was shot on an old Canon 5D Mark II uh, back in 2012, and I shot it with a 500 millimeter f4 lens. But if you shoot at f4, you can get a nice soft background like what I have here, but it's not gonna be the sharpest image. So I actually shot it at f5.6. Had I stopped down a little bit more, it would have been just a little bit crisper as well, but I did want to get the back portion of the line out of focus, so your attention is really right here. Let's dive in and get this processed. I'm going to head over to the develop module and just know that anything that I do in the develop module can also be done in Adobe Camera Raw, so you're more than welcome to do it there. To show you that I'm going to start from what came straight out of camera, I'm going to come down here to the bottom and just hit the reset button to start over. And there's the boring looking original. Uh, when I captured this, I could have uh, captured a little bit brighter. It would have been better, but when you have a subject matter like this and you're working quickly, uh, you're not always thinking right. The reason why I know I could have shot it uh, brighter and it would have looked better is if you look at a histogram, and this is a histogram I could have seen in camera, if you ever see a huge gap over on the right side, it means you could make your exposure brighter. It would push the histogram that way. And as long as you did that without creating a spike on the end, you would be golden. But this is fine. The main thing that tells me this is a fine exposure is that the histogram does not hit the far left and become a spike. If there was a spike there, that would mean I have no detail down here in the dark areas. So let's dive in and get started. We're gonna start in the basic area. And the first thing I want to do is think about the background. I see this bright area here and some bright areas up in here, and I'd like to get them to be a little bit more like the rest of the image. To do that, I'm going to adjust the highlight slider. That's going to try to isolate the brightest areas of the picture, and if I move it to the left, it's going to darken them. So I might even move that all the way down to really get that area closer to the look of the rest of the image. But then down in here, it's really hard to see the detail in those deep shadows. So to compensate for that, I'm going to take the shadow slider and I'm going to bring it up. Now you want to be careful when doing that. If you do this with an image of, let's say, a tree against a blue sky, if you end up moving these to their extremes, you can end up with an object that has a slight glow to it, almost like a dark halo around the edge of a tree. But in this case, since I have a lion, I think it's fine. It's especially with a blurry background there. Uh, I'm not going to notice it so much, but I'm just cautioning you to about doing this on a normal landscape image that might have a bright sky pushed up against a hard edge. Next, I want to get the overall brightness of the image. So I'm going to go to the exposure slider and just start moving it to the right. And pretty quickly, you're going to find that it just kind of starts falling apart. And so I'm going to back off on that until I like the general brightness of the lion's head. With, and I don't think I'm losing too much detail uh, in the bright areas. So somewhere in this general range. Then at this point, the area in the background. I like the color that's there, but the color where the lion is feels just kind of dull and boring. And that's because the lion was in the shade and the shade is usually lit by the blue sky that is above and it will often have a blue tinge to it. I'm going to warm this up by adjusting my white balance. I'll start with temperature and you can see if you push it to the right, you're going to go towards yellow. If you push it too far, it's going to obviously be too far. Move it the opposite direction. You can see when you get too far that way. Now I try to push it so it's too far in both directions and then I don't look at the slider. I don't want to remember where it started. I'm staring at the image instead. And what I'm looking for is not if I want it to look warm or cool. I'm looking to see when do the colors separate the best. When do I see a distinct difference between the colors in the image? And that's what I'm looking for. It takes a little bit of hunting going back and forth in here, but for me, it's right about in this spot right there. 
And therefore, I can see the biggest difference between the white of this portion and the yellow of this portion and the more orangish up here. And that's what I'm looking for. Then I can adjust tint a little bit if I want to, but I don't usually need to quite as much, but that's going to determine if it's a little bit more uh, warm or not. And I'm not going to do that much there, somewhere like that. All right, then at this point, I'm going to try to compensate for the fact that we did this to our shadows and highlights. By doing that, your image can often look rather dull and boring uh, because it is lacking contrast contrast is how big of a difference there is between really bright stuff and really dark stuff. And so I'm going to boost that up a little bit. And as I boost it, dark things get darker, bright things get brighter. And you could think of it as um, kind of undoing part of this, uh, but it's doing it in a way where it's almost as if I'm moving both of these sliders at the same time. Uh, and I can't do that, obviously. So that's why I'm going to end up using contrast. Now, I'm not concerned about the eyes. I'm not looking at those and trying to optimize those. I'm actually going to use the adjustment brush for that particular area. I'm also not going to pay attention to the background. I don't care how colorful it gets or how bright it gets because I'm going to isolate that again with the adjustment brush. Right now, I'm just trying to get the lion itself to look as good as I can. And what I'm noticing right now is that this area, which I'm assuming is the brightest portion of the lion, doesn't look to be all that bright. I also see a hint of that when I look up here at the histogram. In the histogram, if you're not used to them, this is just a bar chart that tells you the brightness levels in your picture. Black is represented on the left, white is on the right, and therefore 50% gray would be in the middle. And you can ignore the colors, just look at the overall shape. If you have really tall lines, that means that shade takes up a lot of space. And if you have really short ones, it means it takes up very little. And if you look on the far right, do you see this gap on the right side of the histogram? That means there's nothing close to white in this picture. So there are a couple things to do about that. Anytime I see a big gap on the right side of the histogram, I always come down here to the slider called whites and I adjust it. In fact, if you want to see which slider would affect which area within the, the histogram, just hover your mouse over the histogram. As you do, you will see various numbers down below for these various sliders. You're going to see them become highlighted to indicate which slider would have the biggest effect on each area. I want to affect this area right here. In fact, I can click right on the histogram in this area and just drag to the right. And I'm going to drag to the right, and I'm not even looking at the picture. I'm looking at the histogram, and I'm trying to make that gap go away, but not so far that it turns into a spike. If I go too far, there's a spike. That means a large area of white. I'm looking for just the first point where the gap goes away. That tells me the highest setting that I would like to use for an image like this. Now, you can find out if anything in your image is actually losing detail because a histogram is kind of basic. It doesn't give you, it doesn't drill it down to fine enough detail. So when you're adjusting the white slider, whenever you're done with it, you might want to come down to that slider and hold down the option key. That's Alt and Windows. I have it held down right now and I'm going to click on the slider. Now, if what you see is what I have, which is solid black everywhere, it means no part of your image in the bright area has lost detail due to this adjustment. But if you continue to move it to the right, you're going to start seeing things show up. And that's where you're starting to lose detail. And if you see colors, that means you're losing partial detail. Because behind the scenes, your image is made out of three colors, red, green, and blue. And that means where it's colorful here that you're only losing detail in one or two of those three colors that make up your image. And it's only when it turns solid white in this view that you've lost all the detail. Now, those areas that are losing all the detail, I usually reserve that for light sources and reflections on shiny things. And if you look at this image, there's no light source directly in the photograph. And the only reflection on something shiny would be the reflection on the eyes. And I'm not going to push that all the way to white. So in general, I'm going to double click on this slider called whites. Double clicking on any slider will reset it to default settings. In this case, zeroing it out. And let's adjust whites uh, once again, because I got on a little side trip there talking about how I think about it. So here's what I'm going to do. Anytime I see a histogram that's got a gap on the far right, I click within the gap and I drag to the right, not even looking at the picture. 
I drag until the gap disappears, the, the shortest distance I can move before that gap disappears, and I let go. That establishes what is the farthest I would want to move this slider without losing detail. Now I look back to the picture and I'm ignoring the background so I'm going to adjust that separate. I'm looking just at the lion and I'm going to now back off on this until I think it looks good. And it's a personal preference with how far you go. I'm going to say maybe right about there. Now, at this point, I'm thinking still about the color. Remember how we adjusted white balance a few moments ago? Well, the other thing we could do is go down here and adjust vibrance or saturation. I'm going to adjust vibrance in this case because what it does is as you turn it up, it'll make the image more colorful, but it's going to concentrate on the areas that are not all that colorful to begin with, and it's going to apply less and less of a change as it gets into the more colorful areas. And therefore, areas like up here should tend not to uh, reach what's known as saturation clipping, which is where you lose detail. Uh, it, vibrance usually prevents that. So anyway, I'm going to adjust this and just look at the line and decide how much do I think I can get away with. It's a personal choice how you like your images to look. Some people like them overdone, in my opinion and others um, have a different opinion. Now, when you're adjusting any of these sliders, you might find that it's hard to get granular control, where if I want to move this and change from 43 to 44, uh, moving the slider here sometimes is difficult. It feels like it jumps in more uh, like uh, in increments of maybe five, especially when you use something like exposure. Here's a tip. If you grab the edge of this adjustment panel and just pull it like this, you can make it wider. Now you're having more granular control. Or if you want really granular control, then hold down the option key, which is Alt and Windows. Then you can pull it beyond its normal limit. Because this image is a vertical, if I were to pull it out this far, now I can have such fine control, it's almost absurd uh, with this but usually it's limited to a particular maximum width. It's only if you hold on option that you can get it to be wider. All right, I don't quite need it that ridiculous, uh, so I'll bring it back. Uh, now let's take a look at where I might head next. At this point, I'm liking the color of the lion. I'm liking the overall uh, brightness of the highlights and things. Uh, what I'm wanting to think about now is detail. So I'm going to click on the image to zoom up. And on the left side of my screen, I can control how far it's zoomed up right here. If I need to zoom up to 100 or on occasion, instead of doing uh, that, I would come down to 50% if you have a very high resolution screen. Then I'm going to come down here to uh, texture and clarity. Texture is going to work on the very fine details within this image. That means the individual hairs on the lion. And for that, I'm actually going to go up to 100% view. Uh, so the individual hairs on the line are going to be affected. And then the one called clarity is going to work on more of the large chunky bits. That means like this dark area right here and how much it separates from this brighter area above. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to bring up my texture and see how that affects the hairs. If I bring it up too far, it can feel a bit artificial. And so I'm just going to kind of swing it back and forth. I try not to look at the slider itself. I try to swing it too far to the low side, which is going to actually blur the image, and then too far to the high side, and then I stare at the image instead of the slider, because therefore I don't remember where I started, and I make all my judgments based on the image itself. Okay, now I might zoom out so I can see the image as a whole, and that's when I'm going to adjust clarity. That's going to work on those chunky bits. So I'll bring it up and see how much do I think I can get away with. If I bring it too high, you see at the bottom of the picture, the dark areas are losing some detail. So I'm going to restrain myself from going too high, and I think I'm going to end up about there. Now at this point, I think the overall look of the line is starting to look okay, and I want to start working with the adjustment brush so that I can isolate areas of the image. So I'll go up here to my adjustment brush icon, 
And if you've used the adjustment brush in the past, this might be set with a bunch of settings in here. These settings are not going to affect your image until you start actually brushing on your image. So even if there's a bunch of numbers typed in in here, uh, they're not going to affect anything yet. If I want to reset them to default settings, I just double click right here on the word effect. That's the heading that is for all of these things. And if I double click there, I can get them reset to zero. And I can either paint first and mess with the sliders later, or I can preload my brush with a guess as to what I would like to do. So in this case, I'm going to preload my brush, which means make an adjustment before painting. I'm thinking about adjusting the background, and I'm thinking what I want to do is make it less colorful. So I'm just guessing how much. And therefore, this is what I'm going to see when I start brushing. Had I not preloaded my brush with a setting, then when I brush around, I'm not going to see anything change within the picture. If that's what you want to do, though, you want to define the area first and then adjust, then at the bottom of your screen, just turn on this checkbox called Show Selected Mask Overlay. That's going to cause it so you see a red overlay in the area you've adjusted. Typing the letter O for overlay toggles that on and off. Uh, so let's come in here now. I got my brush. Before I start brushing down here, I want to look at my settings. I'm going to turn off auto mask. We'll use that later on. By having it turned off, I can just paint in a free form fashion. And I'm going to have my feathering turned way up. So I get a soft edge brush and a flow turned way up all the way to 100. Flow means how much of your adjustment do you get in your first paint stroke. And I want 100% of it because I think I want the same adjustment across the entire background. And I'll also have density up there. Now I'm going to go over here and start painting. So I'm going to get a larger brush. And to change your brush size, I'm using a trackpad at the moment. And if I use two fingers on my trackpad, I can change the size of my brush. If I add the shift key, I can also change how hard the edge is by using two fingers on the trackpad and shift. If you're using a mouse, it'd be the scroll wheel on the mouse that would do the same. So now I'm going to click here and I'm just going to start painting across this background and I'm trying to try not to get too much overspray onto the lion. Maybe go down to about there. All right, then let's start messing with the rest of the sliders that are here. There's this bright area right in here and I'd like to tone it down. So I'm going to take the white slider because whites works on the absolute brightest part of the image and I'm going to bring it down a bit to just try to mellow that out. Now I could try to bring it way down, but it's going to become rather obvious. So I'm not going to go too far too overboard with it and maybe end up around there. Then the other thing I want to do is make that background less colorful so your eye is not drawn to it. We already have our saturation down to negative 58, but that was just a guess. So now I'm going to move this left and right. I'm going to move it too far in both directions and not look at the slider. Instead, look at the image. I find if I look at the slider at all, I get kind of fixated on where I started. And that isn't usually good. So I think somewhere right around there. The other thing is, uh, if you remember, we warmed up the lion by adjusting white balance. We pushed it towards yellow, but that background that's in there was sunlit. And so if we push it towards yellow, it's going to look artificially yellow. So I'm going to come up here and push this a little bit towards blue, which just means away from yellow. And I'm going to move it too far in one direction, too far the other, and then looking at the image instead of the slider, I'm going to get it to where I like it. I think somewhere right about there. And I can, if I want to, uh, also adjust my tint. That's going to make it deciding how warm is the background going to be. And I might warm it up just a little bit, not too far though. Then the other thing is we ended up adjusting the texture and the clarity on the whole image, which really brought out the individual hairs on this lion. And I didn't need to bring out any of that detail that's in the background. So to compensate for applying it to the whole image, I want to kind of get it away from this area. And I could look at what was applied to the whole image and just apply the exact same amount with a negative sign in front of it uh, to simply cancel it out, to make it so there is no um, texture or clarity applied, but I'm just doing it visually here. I don't know if I ended up near uh, the same amount. 
And the other thing I could do to get that background to look nice and soft is I could take this slider called sharpness and put it to a negative setting. And that's going to soften that background. And they come to blurring it a little bit. So that's what I think I'm going to do to my background. If you want to see before and after, there's a little light switch down here in the lower left. And if I click on it, you'll see what it looked like before. We have that distracting background. And then I'll turn this back on and you'll see what it looks like after. And I might just toggle that on and off to see are there any areas that need more of that or are, did it overlap the line too much? And I think it did overlap the line on the right side too much and a little bit at the top. So what I might do is just uh, move my brush on top of the image and extend this down just a little bit into there. Then over here at the bottom, there's a choice called erase. And I'm just going to choose erase. And I will bring down the feathering on my brush a bit. So I have a little bit harder of an edge. And now I can come into where the lion is. And I'm just going to try to get it off of any of that lion where it might have been too much. But some places like right up here, I think I got some overlap on the background. So I'll type Command Z to undo. And this is where you want to work on a small area at a time, like right there and let go then right up here and let go because when you type command Z to undo if you've done all of this in a single paint stroke it's going to undo your, the entirety of the change that you had made whereas if you do this in small little strokes then you can vary the softness of your brush I just made mine softer uh, and you can vary a lot of other things uh, also if you want to only partially remove the change you're making, then change the flow. I might bring the flow down to, let's say about 50%, and that's gonna take away half of the change. And so it might be over here where I can see through to the background that I'm only removing 50%, because if I remove 100%, it um, just feels like I, I'm bringing back some of the overly colorful uh, background, and that's not what I'm looking for. All right, I think I have that looking okay. Now, if I'm done adjusting one area up here near the top, right near the brush icon, I have the choice of new. And when I do that, if I mouse over my image, you'll see we have here a pin. That pin represents the first adjustment I made. That's where I first clicked to apply the adjustment. If I hover over that pin, you should get a red overlay. And that shows you where this is applying. And I notice it's covering up his ear quite a bit. So as long as I still have that set to erase, I could come in here and get it off of the ear. Just remember I have my uh, flow set to 50%, so I might need to go over it a few times to get it all the way. But I could hover over that. Or if you want that to stay on while you're painting, that's the checkbox at the bottom of your screen, which can be turned on by typing the letter O. And so we have that. Then also, if I want to adjust flow, you can use the number keys on your keyboard. Look at the number for flow. I'm going to type 7, then 9, then 2, and you see it moving around based on the number I'm typing. And therefore, you can very quickly dial in what you're doing using all of the keyboard shortcuts I'm mentioning here. If you also recall that brush size is two fingers straight up and down on the trackpad and add shift to that to change how soft the edge is. And if you do all those things, it's going to make that much faster to be able to come in here and work your images. I'm going to turn off the overlay by typing the letter O, or just turn off the checkbox at the bottom of my screen. And now let's work on the bottom section of this picture. To do that, I'm going to choose New, which is right below the actual brush icon. And that's going to take that pin that has a black dot in it that indicates it's what you're currently working on, and it'll make it so the dot is no longer black. And therefore, it means you're no longer working on that adjustment. Now, you'll find my pins disappear when I move my mouse over here to the adjustment sliders. They only appear when I have my uh, mouse over this gray area or the image itself. And that's because in the lower left, there's a choice called Show Edit Pins. It's currently set to Auto, and that's when it acts the way I have it. I think the default setting is set to Always, and that makes it so those pins show up even when you're over here moving sliders. I much prefer that being set to auto because then I see just the image when I'm moving the sliders. So now we're going to come down here to the bottom. And in the bottom, I'm going to attempt to isolate that area. But before I do, you'll notice that my brush is preloaded with the saturation set to negative 58. 
It doesn't have all the other sliders I used in the image uh, last. It only has the sliders that I changed before I had clicked on the picture. Once I clicked on the picture, any changes I made to those sliders do not get preloaded into your brush. That bottom portion, I don't know if I need my saturation at negative 58. So to reset things, I'm going to double click here on the word effect, and that's going to dial everything to zero. When I paint down there at the bottom, I want to be able to see where I'm painting. So I'm going to turn on the checkbox that's called show selected mask overlay. So the bottom left of my screen, I'll do it by typing the letter O for overlay. Therefore, when I click and drag on my picture like this, I just see a red overlay. And I just want to make sure that my flow is turned to 100, and so is my density. And I'm going to try to get this grass area down at the bottom. But I don't want to affect the lion. So I'm going to choose a race and try to get this off of the lion. And to help me out, I might turn on Auto Mask. What Auto Mask does is when you move your mouse on top of your image, it's going to look at the color that's in the center of your brush, right where that little minus sign is right now. And it's going to try to remove it from everything that is the color that's underneath that little minus sign. But it's only going to do it from within the circle. So I'm going to get that minus sign on top of a color that is in the elephant. I'm going to click and I'm going to drag like this, seeing if I can get it to remove it from these yellow colors and the really dark ones. And then I might need to come in and just brush a little bit back if it got rid of too much but I'm trying to be careful with not extending the circle that is my brush too far out in space. All right, I'm thinking that's good enough. Maybe a little bit up here to get rid of. But I find the red overlay to be useful because sometimes the adjustments I'm dialing into an area are rather subtle. They're not blatantly easy to see, and therefore the red overlay makes it much easier to tell where I'm working. I'm going to now type the letter O to turn off the overlay. That just turns off the checkbox at the bottom of my screen. And what I'd like to do to this area is make it so the detail is not as attractive. I don't want your eye to be drawn to it quite as much as it is right now. So if you remember, we cranked up both texture and clarity on the whole image. And I'm going to try to undo it from that bottom part. In fact, I'm going to bring texture down until it actually softens. And if you look at that area in the lower left corner, I'll double click on texture to bring it back to default settings. You'll be able to see the difference as I bring it down. Then I'm also going to bring down clarity and I'm just going to watch the image, bring it down until I think it's nicely soft. I wanted it to look almost like that was out of focus and I'm getting a little bit of that feeling right now. Then at this point, I want to start working on the uh, eyes in the image. So what I'm going to do is come in here and I'll zoom up to 100% so I can really see what's going on in the eyes. If I press my space bar, space bar gives me the hand tool and I want to isolate the eyes. So I'm going to choose new up here and I'm going to just double check that all the sliders are at zero. And if they weren't, I'd double click on the word effect. Now I want to isolate the eyes. So I'm going to turn on the overlay. Now I won't see anything when I first turn it on because I haven't painted anywhere but I'll just type the letter O for overlay and that turns on that checkbox at the bottom of my screen. When I look at the eye, if I want to isolate it, I don't want a soft edge brush because a soft edge brush would give me a gradual transition and there simply is not a gradual transition here. So I'm going to get my brush to be relatively hard edged. In this case, I got my feathering down to about 20 and I'm going to get a brush maybe about this big. Now I end up using brushes that are much larger than most people use. And that's because I hate trying to get into little corners like the corner of the eye and getting tiny brushes to do so. What I'd rather do is paint like this and get the top edge just right. Then what I'll do is I can take away and just take away the bottom. To take away, you can use your keyboard if you'd like. Otherwise, just click on that choice called Erase. To temporarily get to Erase, hold down the Option key on your keyboard. If you're on a Mac, that's Alt and Windows. And for the length of time you have it held down, you'll be on that choice called Erase. 
just be careful because all of the settings that are found underneath there, like the size of your brush, the feathering, the flow, and the auto mask um, are unique to that erase setting. So if I let go of option, watch the sliders in the lower right of my screen. Those are the settings for erase. When I let go of option, do you see how they moved around? So don't expect that you have the same brush settings when you hold down option or when you click on the word erase. Glance over there and see if you might want to come over here and turn off auto mask and if you might want to adjust your uh, opacity brush size that type of thing so anyway i'm going to come in here i'm holding down that option key and i'm going to then take away down here at the bottom and by doing that in this way i don't have to get a tiny brush to get into the corner of the eye i can use a large brush and just add uh, only being careful at the top edge of the eye and then take away to define the bottom. At this point, I think I've isolated the eye, so I'm going to type a letter O that turns off the overlay. That's the checkbox at the bottom of my screen. And if I move my mouse over to the sliders, that little um, point that's on the eye should go away. That's because in the lower left, I have that setting set to auto, which says show edit pins. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to adjust the exposure to try to brighten up that eye. So I'm just going to grab this and I'm going to first move it too far. And then I'm going to back off on it and I'm just going to move it back and forth. And I'm trying not to look at the slider itself. I'm trying to instead uh, just evaluate the image as a whole and decide what is truly the highest I can get away with. Who cares if it's moving the slider just a little bit or a lot? The other slider I could think about using here instead of exposure or in addition to it would be whites. Uh, the difference is exposure thinks about a wider range of the image and it, uh, whereas whites thinks only about the absolute brightest areas. It'll bring a, along the rest of the, uh, the brightness levels in your picture, but it's concentrating on the absolute brightest. It's saying how bright should that absolute bright uh, area be. And so it depends on the image. Oftentimes it will be whites that I use, but you'll see with whites, there's only so far you can get. And let's say I maxed it out and I need to go further. Well, that's when I come up here to exposure. And so let's say about there. Another thing you can do if you want to detail in an area that looks rather dark is to lower the contrast. And that will also often open up uh, an area that otherwise looked dark. The other thing I want to do is to get your eye to be drawn to that eye, I'm going to bring up the saturation to make it a little bit more colorful. I don't want to bring it up so far though that the blue in the center of the eye becomes distracting. So I might even back off a little bit there. Then I'm going to work on the opposite eye. And so here at the top, I'm going to choose new and then I'm going to turn on that overlay once again by typing the letter O for overlay so that when I paint, I see a red overlay. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to, in this case, define the bottom edge of the eye by going about like that, the bottom and the right side. Then I'm going to hold down the option key, Alt and Windows, which means take away. And I'm going to do that and that think I have it isolated. I probably should have clicked right in the middle of the eye to begin with just so this pin appears right in the middle because that pin represents the adjustment and if I see it off somewhere else later on I might get confused by it. But if I just click on it and drag though it's going to move it so I can't reposition it afterwards. Uh, so if I wanted to I could really start over but uh, since I've isolated that area, I'm going to type the letter O to turn off the overlay and then let's come in here and adjust. Uh, remember our whites is going to be able to do a little bit, but it's really going to be limited in how far you can move it. So exposure will be able to do a lot more. And so I'm just going to bring that up until it's as bright as I think I can get away with. Uh, the other thing you can do on occasion with eyes is if you want the dark portion of the eye to be a little more prominent, you can take this black slider and move it to the left. That's going to darken starting at the absolute darkest part of the eye. And so if I move that quite a bit, though, I might need to overcompensate with uh, moving the exposure the opposite direction. All right, now let's zoom back out on our picture. We'll just get it to fit. And you can see what's going on. If I turn off this little light switch in the lower left, it's going to disable all of those changes we've made thus far. 
and you can see the top of the image dramatically changing the eyes and also that bottom um, area. And with that, let's see how far we've taken this image. I'm gonna hit the reset button below. This is what we started with, straight out of camera, no changes. I'll type Command Z, it's Control Z in Windows to undo. And here's how far we've pushed it thus far. And let me know if you would like to be able to play with the exact same images when I'm going through these tutorials. Because if enough people would be interested in that, I'd consider adding a Patreon account. And if so, if you became a Patreon member, you'd be able to download and work with the same images. I might also go further into depth. Like this image, there's a bunch of stuff I could continue changing. I could come up here and grab our little um, spot removal brush. I could set it to heal. I could tell you why I always have feather almost always turned to zero. And I could come in here and do things like get rid of this one area over here on the left that bothers me. And I can tell you why it's going to pick a terrible place to copy from and how you can actually choose from an area that you might not think would work out right. But if you actually understand how this tool worked, I could do that in more extended tutorials. And I could come in and show you other little changes I'd make with some bonus materials. So let me know if you'd like me to do something like that with a Patreon account, because I would consider setting it up and investing more time for people that would join.